And uh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, you know, that's how Indigo used to make announcements. So all of you are, um, have been here for quite some time, right? For about uh, three weeks, close to a month, all right? And uh, perhaps this is the first chemistry lecture for you? Second. Second one, what was the first one? Okay, so that was all theory, and this is all ex experiment, okay? And in science, perhaps all science, all areas of science except mathematics, theory and experiments go together, okay? First you have an observation, do an experiment, and then you try to understand how things go. Okay, and as Ambika has mentioned, that the exit doors are there, two on the rear side and one on the front, and we are doing, we have been doing these sort of experiments for the last 20 years, and uh, we take extreme precaution to make sure that nothing goes wrong, uh, including having fire extinguishers here, and I hope all of you know how to use them. That is carbon dioxide, and this is probably dry powder. Okay, so we are ready for any eventuality. But one of the most important aspects about doing chemistry experiments is to take precautions, and that's why I'm a bit overdoing it, okay, or overemphasizing it. Okay, so June 12, anybody's birthday today? June 12? No. But it turns out that, you know, every day in the history of chemistry, rather history of science in general and history of chemistry in particular, something exciting has happened, okay? So we would like to highlight this by remembering Fritz Lippmann, who was born in 1899, and he discovered coenzyme A and the central role of ATP in, meta in, in metabolism. You know, that's what keeps us going. ATP is the battery, or power source in, in the human body. So he got the Nobel Prize in medicine in 1953. He's a German-American uh, scientist. The second person is Bert Zachmann. You know, in Germany, S is pronounced as Z, and Z as S, okay? And he worked on single ion channels uh, in cells, which are very important because how ions get transported across the membranes. You know, that maintains the sodium potassium balance in our body. And he got the Nobel Prize in medicine in 1991. So we will have a bit of celebration. I'll come back to this slide a few slides down. First thing that I would like to highlight to you is it is very important in the study of any subject, including science, to ask questions, okay? Because it is only by asking questions and not by writing answers that you understand things. And as I often jokingly say, that most of the coaching classes basically train the students for finding three wrong answers quickly, uh, rather than finding the correct answer in many cases, okay? If you don't believe me, here is a gentleman who says that, remember when you were you know, seven, eight, nine years old and you come back from school and whoever is at home, maybe your grandparents, maybe your mother if she was not working, Normally they would ask you, what did you learn today? Or how was your day? This gentleman says, not my mom. My mom would ask, did you ask a good question today? And then he goes on to say that that difference, asking good questions, made me become a scientist. And who is this? He is I, or he was I, I, Rabi, who got the Nobel Prize in physics in 1944 for discovering the resonance method for recording the magnetic properties of atomic nuclei. Let me highlight three key words. I'm going to ask you questions. What is this technique? Nuclear magnetic resonance, NMR. No, this has nothing to do with electrons. This is because of nuclear spin, okay? So you might have heard about MRI. MRI is basically a biological or other medical application of this technique, which was first discovered by I.I. Rabi in physics, and of course there were other people. And let me then come back to something else for a moment, because as you perhaps know, 2022 and 2023, was declared by United Nations as the 
year of basic sciences for sustainable development. And the way things have happened in the last 120 years or so is pretty alarming, as you know, that uh, the weather change is one of the things that you are observing. Uh, waste problems and many other issues related to indiscriminate use of resources. So I would like to highlight this because chemists play an important role in making things happen with less pollution. Let me, because I'm not, I'm not going to give a one, one hour lecture on this, so I'll just highlight in a few statements. Earth gets only sunlight. Nothing goes out. We are not dumping any garbage outside. We are not bringing in any material from outside. So we have to live with what we have. All human processes utilizes energy, as you know, and increases disorder. Another way of saying it by thermodynamic point of view is that we increase entropy in whatever we do, okay? So we take concentrated ores, extract the metal, and distribute them, okay? And you also know the three R's. What are the three R's? Reduce, reuse, recycle, okay? Reduce and reuse do not require expenditure of energy, but recycling does. And recycling of many things still do not have the technology available. So even if you have the technology available, any waste recycling requires energy. And the energy has to come from sun. And there is no direct way of converting sunlight into energy without using materials. And you know, there are beautiful solar panels over the parking slots here, which appears to be very, very simple, efficient, and so on. But in 10 to 15 years from now, we have to worry about disposing of or recycling these thousands of, or hundreds of square kilometers of solar panels. That technology does not exist as on today. So you need to keep this in mind. In the context of this, whenever this Q appears, okay, I will ask you a question, all right? So one of the ways is to reduce the usage of resources and reduce waste. Let me ask you a question, general question. It's a GK question, actually. Suppose I ask you to reduce the water that comes out of your flush tank. Every time you flush, certain amount of liter comes out, liters of water comes, comes out, right? I would like you to reduce it by exactly one liter. And that can save millions of gallons of water. How do you do it? Using waste, <laughs> waste materials. That's the first question. You can come up with the answers either at the end or during the tea break. Yeah? No, I'm saying that your existing toilet, um, toilet system, I want to reduce whatever, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. So sometimes one liter bottle may not fit in. So you can you can use two five hundred ml bottle or you know a few of these whatever number fits in here and still you know makes the system flush. Thank you. That's the correct answer. Or one of the correct possible answers. You can also put a stone, but then that adds a lot of weight to that. Okay. Before we begin. This sort of a uh, demo is not possible without the support and assistance of a large number of people. And let me thank my students, Indranil Set and Gaurav Sharma, who have prepared all these materials which have brought from, from Bangalore. Uh, Dr. Palani Raja Subramanian from Merck, Bangalore, who has supplied some of the more expensive chemicals that I use, uh, I am going to use today. And they are all, um, they, they all have been packed by Indranil and Gaurav. Thank you, Shamita, for uh, coming to Bangalore, uh, despite your teaching load in uh, Bangalore. Uh, and uh, she is going to help me with some of these experiments. And of course, Pierre Iqbal, please raise your hand, uh, who has helped us set up all these experiments. Uh, Harshvardhana, raise your hand. There he is. Then Promiti Mitra. Ashka Shah, 
and of course Aditya there. Okay, so thank you all for being part of this chemistry show. All right, Tejas, where is Tejas? Yeah, there is Tejas, right, I missed you. Okay, so we now begin chemistry is fun, but there should be a cue here. Where is this picture taken? Cape Town, yeah, this is the so-called Table Mountain. Okay, something is everywhere. Chemistry, let's put the words together. Chemistry is everywhere, okay? But very often we don't appreciate that, you know? Chemistry is often ignored in favor of physics and biology. Here's an example. When I say chemistry is everywhere, here's a, uh, this is a multigrain bread from some company which I don't want to disclose, but all companies have a very similar things. And if you look at the label, it lists out, I mean to be careful about that, it lists out a number of ingredients that have been used. And you can learn a great deal of chemistry if you try to understand why these are used and what they are. If you do that, these are the so-called E numbers or INS number, international numbering systems. And if we simply focus on these, we see that you, know, you have calcium propionate, ammonium chloride, amylase, acetic acid, calcium phosphate, blah, 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 various kinds of ingredients. These are not bad chemicals. These are all allowed food additives, which are used for improving the quality, improving the shelf life, and so on. Okay? You should not get unduly alarmed by these numbers, but you need to know about it. You should know what you are getting in, in the loaf of bread or in a packed food that you are eating. I should also perhaps tell you that many of the packed foods that you buy in, in flights, for example, uh, the upma, for example, it contains, one pack of upma contains 55% of the salt that you need in your body, okay? And that gives you only 20% of the calories that you need. So you need to watch out. At your age, you have to be, you can be a little more uh, careless, but a pack of these cup of noodles or upma gives you more than half the salt that you need every day. So keep this in mind. Okay. Anybody knows when this picture, picture was taken? This was long back. Yeah, this is the so-called blue marble taken by the crew of the last manned mission to the moon, Apollo 17, in 1972. And this is a picture of Mars. And if we are not careful today, the time is not far away when the blue marble may look like this, okay? So we need to be careful about that. And as I said, chemistry is everywhere. And here is an example that all of you have seen not too long ago. All of you have witnessed this event even almost on time. And you have seen this image, right? This is the Mars rover, the latest one, Perseverance, that is being lowered by uh, the spacecraft. And of course, this is a beautiful, a machine, right? Now, it takes a lot of physics, it takes a lot of engineering to get this spacecraft on the surface of another planet or a moon. But then, what is the purpose? Purpose, primarily, is to do chemistry on another, another planet. Because only by studying chemistry on another planet, you can figure out whether life at all existed or the conditions would be suitable for sustenance of human life on such a planet. And if we look at the, what some of these equipments do, other than the radar, most of them are, in fact, designed to carry out specific chemical experiments. So no matter how much children of your age or even younger students get excited about planetary missions, but the ultimate goal of most of these planetary missions is to do chemistry on the surface of other planets. And here is another example of a rover. I say this is a, one of the most expensive remote control cars that you can drive, uh, about $400 million. And uh, this is uh, 
positioning a spectrometer against this rock to find out the chemical composition. And this was in July 1997. I'm showing you some old data. So this is actual chemical data that this instrument acquired that showed the presence of a lot of phosphorus, a lot of iron, calcium, and so on. And here is one more picture of uh, a picture taken by the so-called Huygens probe uh, in the Cassini mission. OK, which went to which planet? Saturn. And Titan is the second largest moon in the solar system, I believe. And it's actually a picture taken by on the surface of Titan when before the probe crashed. And again, I would like to highlight, this is the internal structure of the probe, Huygens probe. And what you see are batteries protecting and, sur uh, and surrounding a spectrometer, which is called GCMS, okay, which is very commonly used for analyzing vapors of uh, mixture like petrol vapor. Okay, so again, I would like to highlight that it is very important to understand that there is chemistry everywhere. Okay, and here you see I'm actually doing an experiment on the surface of Mars. Okay, you don't believe it? If you don't believe it, I have a boarding pass. July 2026, I will go to Mars and do some experiments, and hopefully there'll be an audience. Okay, jokes apart, that was a joke. You can also get a boarding pass if you go to the NASA website and impress your parents and friends. Okay, so here I have distances or length scale from 10 to the power minus nine meter all the way to 10 to the power plus 10 meter. It can be larger also. Physics largely deals with things which are really small or really big. Biology deals with things which are objects that we see and some which we require microscope to see. Chemistry is sandwiched between the low end of physics and low end of biology, if I may use such words. Okay, so we deal with distances in this range, atoms and molecules which are quite tiny, which we cannot see. And that's part of the reason why chemistry is often ignored, because you know, why do you bother about things that you cannot see? Okay, but chemistry is something that we would discuss today. Okay, with this elaborate introduction, let me get back to business. I hope I have been able to kind of get across to you why studying chemistry is important, because every day, starting from the time you squeeze out the toothpaste on, your, on the brush, you know, you are using materials developed by chemistry. There's no prize in guessing what this is. Iron pillar, right? It's about 16 centuries old. But what is this? You may not have seen this. This is a chemical reactor. Those of you who are in class 11 or higher would have studied about this. I will come back to this later. But in case you have a guess, you can tell me now. Or I will come back to this towards the end of the presentation. This, have a chem, uh, this is a chemical reactor about, which, is, which plays a very important role in making things which keep us alive. Okay, let me put it that way. I don't want to disclose too many things. So that's the question here. Okay, I said June 12 is the birthday of Lippmann and uh, Zaxman, and we will do a bit of uh, celebration for that. Oh. Oh, that? But that is virtual. We are going to do it real. <clears throat> okay. All right. These are hydrogen balloons of about two liter size, and we are going to ignite them. And it's a very safe experiment, but I don't want to have my back to the wall, literally, okay? It should not be a problem. Okay, I will leave it alone. One more? Okay. Okay, after that, 
Happy birthday to Lipman and Zaxman. Okay, and as I told you that it will not trigger the um, smoke alarm because we don't generate any smoke. What is the chemistry here? 2H2 plus O2 giving H2O. 2H2O. All right? Thank you. Let that be happy there. Okay. Um, no, if we have to do more, we can do it outside. Okay, so this, my, here's a question. You know, every experiment has a question behind it. Suppose the volume of the balloon is about roughly 2.2 liters. How much water did we make, liquid water, by bursting each balloon? Think about it. Think about gas law that all of you have studied. So I would like to know how many grams of water we have produced in the form of steam, of course, because it burnt. Uh, thank you for pointing out about the smoke alarm, okay? But uh, so far, I have not triggered a smoke alarm, uh, you know, in the last 20 years or so. <clears throat> so that's that. So you figure out what would be the um, what would be the volume of water produced or mass of water produced. All right. So the next experiment. So two volunteers. No, you cannot. You are not. You are not eligible. No. No, you are not eligible. I'll tell you why. Come here. No. I said. Huh? Because you wear glasses. Somebody, somebody who doesn't wear glasses. Yeah, please come. Okay, but I, I need only at the most two. You know, chemistry. Of, come, come here. So, uh, Shamita, you take care of that. No, I, I, no, you, you get them to wear the gloves and the, this one. So you have to put on a glove on your right hand. You have to put, on a, put a glove on your left hand. We are not doing anything really nasty, OK? Very, very simple chemistry. You know, as I said, chemistry often looks like magic. As a matter of fact, magicians use physics and chemistry principles to, um, to show their magic, but they won't tell you what the science is behind. So I will ask you, what's your name? Shaw. Shaw? Shaw. Shaw. OK, and you? OK, so you hold it here. If I were a magician, I will say nothing is written here, but that would be a lie. Hold it here. Move it up. Somebody is telling you a nonsense. Huh? Yes? No. I'll come back to that. Let's find out. Okay, let's, we'll, we'll find out. So I have a liquid here, and I'm going to spray this on, on this kind of white uh, banner. It's very safe, but it is only for safety and illustration of safety that I've asked you to put on the safety glass and this one. Oops. It's not, it's more fun, in fact. F being. <laughs> okay, so this is the fun part of it. But in terms of chemistry, there are three chemicals involved. No lemon juice, but that was a good guess. Lemon juice would appear if I put an iron on it, right? Because the citric acid becomes carbon. I have three chemicals, one here, and obviously two different chemicals here, right? One which turns. Blue, the other one is uh, no, deep red. No? No? Do we have, okay, thank you. You can remove your glasses and the glove and uh, go back. And can we, can we stick it here with some tape? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for your participation. Okay. OK. You, you take this, and you take this. And somebody who answered the question about first question. Yeah, she gets one. Oh, 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 oh I'm sorry. 
I, I can give you another fresh one. Okay. All right. So what is the chemistry? Any guesses? Chocolate's waiting here. Yeah. 1.8 is roughly the amount. Right. So 1.76, 1.8, two chocolates. All right. Now I think I will not take a risk. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, in, in terms of the chemistry, what are the two colors that are formed and what is this? I, I will give you a hint. No, iodine is dangerous. We are not going to use iodine. No indicator. You can see the bottle. There is no smell. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you what this one is. Okay, if that helps. This is ferric chloride. Okay, I think since we don't, we have we have many experiments to show. No, this is FeCl3, and the chemistry is as follows. The letters which turn blue were written with potassium ferrocyanide, and this is a material that was used as a blue paint from the 17th and 18th centuries. It's called Prussian blue. You might have read, you might read in your class 11 or 12, but the ones which turned like this, written with iron, uh, potassium thiocyanate, because that forms a complex with iron, okay? So this is a nice way to you know, show a magic with three different chemicals. Okay, have you heard about optical activity? What are they? They are not necessarily molecules. Well, they are organic molecules, not necessarily or only organic molecules, which have a mirror image relationship. But then the mirror images do not overlap with each other. Non-superimposable mirror images, mirror image molecules. It's like your socks, which are mirror image and superimposable, but the shoes are not. That's why we have trouble putting the right foot into the left shoe. Okay, there's a match and mismatch. Can you think of any optically active molecule that you have in your home? You know, every household, no matter how rich or how poor they are, will always have three pure, Chemical substances. Oxygen. Huh? Oxygen. Oxygen. Uh, well, oxygen is not pure. And that's, it's something that you have to buy. Not LPG. Salt is one. Sugar is one. No, ascorbic acid, not everybody keeps. And water. Okay, water may not be bacteriologically pure, but chemical, it's 99.9% .9 pure, of which one of them is optically active. Sugar, right? All right, so can I have the next tray here? You want to test? Yeah. So optically active molecules rotate the plane of polarization of light that you perhaps know. Okay, so what I will do um, is a little bit of help I need from one of you. So I have no, before that, let me let me explain. Let me explain. So you, uh, I'll just smear smear one hmm. on the one second. Let's make out which one is which. Hmm. This one, you put some drops and mix it here, and these things you keep separate. You yeah, you smear some of the liquid. Okay. So uh, it turns out that optically active molecules of the two mirror image forms are very important in biology and in chemistry. Uh, can we reduce the background noise to some extent? Uh, for example, these are molecules which are called limonene or limonene, okay? And the one that you see on the left is how the orange smells like, okay? So that is called R-limonene. Why these are called R, the other one is called S, that you will learn eventually, okay? if you continue to study chemistry. 
whereas very similar molecules, this is called carbon, and they are, they have different smells. Even though they're mirror image like molecules, they have different smell. So this smells like orange, this smells like turpentine. Whereas this one smells like pudina, and this one smells like shajira. You know, shajira is a very small, tiny version of jira, which is used for a somewhat expensive biryani. Okay, not, not the cheap varieties, because they are expensive. So normally, in textbooks, you will see these structures, and then you will be made to think that seeing is believing. But I believe that smelling is believing. So I will let you smell the R and S version of these two. You can, you can ask each student to take the R in the right hand, S in the left hand, smell one, give a pause, five second pause, smell the other one, and see for yourself or smell for yourself that they are different. They are mirror image forms of R carbon and S carbon. Don't mix up the R and S. Okay, and then after you smell, you pass it on to the next person in the same way. You start, you give some from the backside also. Okay, as you can see, right to right, left to left. Okay. You know, periodic table is very important. Although NCRT seems to think differently. Okay, as far as class 10 syllabus is concerned. But so to make this statement about the importance of periodic table, perhaps some of you have noticed that I'm wearing a periodic table tie. Right? I don't think so. This is, uh, I got it from a friend in Moscow State University. So in terms of the periodic table, you have all seen or read about periodic table, but I would like to draw your attention to, I think I, we should avoid, yeah, can, can we have the discussion postponed to uh, the discussion time? So I would like you to focus on this isotopesmatter.com website because in periodic table you learn not only about elements, but also about isotopes of elements, okay? If you go to this website, you will also learn what are isotopes and why are they useful. And I'll give you one quick example here. There was a mummified body nicknamed Oatzi found on the Austrian Alps towards the late 90s, 1990s. And what they found is that by doing a series of isotopic investigations that, you know, where he lived, what he ate, what he ate as the last meal, and so on and so forth. Okay, so by doing very careful isotopic analysis of different parts of your body, people can actually tell you whether you have grown up in the high altitude, like in Uttarakhand or in Chennai. Okay, by analyzing the deuterium content in your nails, in your tooth enamels. Okay, so isotope analysis is very, very important and critical. So, this is the most celebrated isotopically substituted molecule, D2O, yes or no? You have all heard about D2O, right? It also has a nickname, heavy water. Why is it heavy water? It, it has a heavier isotope, almost double the mass of a proton. If somebody offers you a glass of heavy water though, please say thank you, but no thank you. Okay, because heavy water can kill you. And just to highlight this point, I'm showing you tobacco plants grown in 0% D2O and 30, 50, 60, and 70% D2O. And you can see that the growth has become retarded. All right. And that is because of a, an effect called kinetic isotope effect. You will probably study, if you are studying chemistry, you will learn it in college. We'll not get back to that. And here are some data of D2O and some on H2O, which tells you why it is called heavy water. You also notice that D2O has a higher freezing point or melting point than H2O. And here is my question. If I give you a sample of D2O and H2O, 
how do you know which one is which? What experiment you will do if I give you only 3 ml of D2O, that it is D2O? Any suggestions? Yeah. By measuring the mass of a fixed volume, OK? Yes? Yeah, go ahead. OK. By measuring, uh, both answers are correct. OK. So both of you will get chocolates. One here in this corner and one there. One here and one, you will get it, OK? So uh, one of you can go and give him, what's your name? OK, so he gets a chocolate. OK, sometimes if both experiments are correct, you have to decide what experiment I should do here so that all of you are, all of you get entertained. If I measure the density, which is what you suggested, that is measure the mass of 3 ml of water, which will be 3 grams. 3 grams of D2O will be 3.3 grams. But then I will measure the mass here, and you will get bored. OK? You will start looking at uh, your, your mobile or whatever. But it turns out that ice, H2O ice, floats on H2O. D2O ice will also float on D2O. But it turns out that D2O ice is slightly heavier than H2O. So if I have some water and drop a piece of H2O ice, of course it will float, but D2O ice will sink. OK, so that's the experiment we are going to do now. Yeah, please bring it here. And I need my box. I'm avoiding calling it a different name. And I need some ice chips also in this beaker. This is a fun experiment. And what I have here are samples of H2O and D2O, which are frozen in these small syringes. OK? And are colored differently. What does it say? It, does, it says new set. You know, my students, all the time, they won't tell me which one is which. They said, anyway, you are going to do an experiment. And experiment is the best way to figure certain things out, right? But these are color coded by them. You see this little piece of ice? One is H2, one is D2, one is orange, which is colored with this biryani uh, food color. And this is a palak food color. OK, this is green. So we are going to take ice cold water. And I will tell you why we take ice cold water here in this measuring cylinder. Let it get really cold. And then I take out this 3 ml of one ice, 3 ml of another ice, and warm it up a little bit. Otherwise, because these are really frozen very hard. OK, so that is H2O or D2O. This is H2O or D2O. Kamita, can you help me with this experiment? So I will ask you to hold this one. Let me get the ice chips out of this. We'll come back to the question of why ice floats on water. OK. And the reason we are using ice cold water is because D2O freezes at 3.8, H2O at 0. So this is below the freezing point of D2O and will keep the D2O ice longer for some time. You come and hold it here. Hold it at the bottom. And nowadays, uh, you hold it a little bit that side so that students from the other side can see it. And I have this million dollar gadget to push this ice cube into the water. And these days, they say, go green. So I'm going green first. But then if it floats, it is H2O. If it sinks, it is D2O, right? Let's see what happens here. Oh, it's still frozen hard. It's not coming out so easily. You see the power of salt and ice, yeah. right? 
Salt and ice is what I call a poor man's deep freezer. The Kulfi mix, right? Okay, so this should be okay. Oh, it sank. All right? And, and now you see the difference between measuring density versus dropping it in ice, and everybody could see it. All right. So sometimes if you have two possible, oh, two possible experiments, you should do one which is A, easier to do sometimes, or one which is suitable for the purpose of why you are doing it. Now this is sort of like finishing the experiment. Uh, my students have not wasted two samples of D2O, thank you. So this is definitely not D2O, it's not sinking. And what you will see, the reason we took ice cold water is because, thank you Shamita. But, yeah, and then, um, one okay. of the things, huh? Ha, so you, you show it around after a few minutes, couple of minutes, because what happens is, and that's the purpose of taking ice cold water, this ice will melt faster or this ice will melt faster? Water ice, okay. So you will see in about four or five minutes time, this is nearly gone and this is still there. But then when the D2O melts, the remaining part of the D2O ice will float in its own melt. Okay, so you'll see kind of levitating between the green and the slightly orange layers. Okay, so I will leave this one here, and Shamita, you keep an eye on it. And as soon as this one is gone, this will be partially molten, and then it can be shown around. May, may, maybe you can take it that side and show people around when both the, both the pieces are there, and with time it will become a little bit of, uh, of a uh, mess. Okay, so we can clear this tray and get ready for the next experiment. Okay, one more point about uh, periodic table. Because on my periodic table, there are quite a bit of these elements which are collectively called lanthanides or rare earth elements. All of you have smartphones, right? And there is something called elements of a smartphone. Or this is the periodic table of a smartphone and you may not believe it, a smartphone has 42 elements out of 118 in the periodic table, okay? And many of them are lanthanides. Some are listed here, which go into the screen, and there are some which go into the electronics. So basically there are four components here, screen, electronics, battery, and casing. So together they have about 42 elements, give or take a few, but then, there are many endangered elements which are used for making smartphones. And they are going to, we are going to run out of them in another 30 to 40 years, okay? And some maybe for a little longer time. And that includes even simple elements like silver, gallium, and germanium, and some of the lanthanides, okay? Therefore, even if you have the urge of replacing your Smartphone, please delay it to the extent possible, okay? That is for the benefit of the earth. Okay, one more experiment. What, anybody can guess? Can anyone guess? Elephant, Elephant toothpaste experiment. Okay, this is a fun experiment, but the experiment illustrates which principle of chemistry? It's all fun, you know, to see a, the, huh? Um, yes and no. It actually implies catalysis, okay? Because hydrogen peroxide, of course we know it has more oxygen than water, and it would like to get rid of the excess oxygen. So it is an unstable compound, and technically it is called thermodynamically unstable, but kinetically stable. In other words, it is intrinsically an unstable compound, but it is very slow in its reaction or in its decomposition. But these slow things can be catalyzed, okay, by catalysts. And I'm sure that you have studied some uh, 
some uh, you have some knowledge of catalysis. Uh, those of you who are biology majors would probably know or biology studying biology, you know that enzymes are good biological catalysts. They make life possible, okay? Because they catalyze every reaction possible in our body at 37 degrees and at pH 7.4 or so. So we are going to do an experiment in which we'll show that sodium iodide or potassium iodide acts as a catalyst. We need to empty this uh, tray. So to do this experiment, we take some liquid soap. I will hide the label because I'm not promoting this brand. Any uh, liquid soap will do. So I take some liquid soap here. Okay, and I add hydrogen peroxide to this, good amount, okay, I need one more beaker or something, another beaker or something you can give me. So we mix it with soap because the liberating oxygen will form bubbles and it will come out. So I mix them nicely. I have to be careful about hydrogen peroxide because you know it can burn my skin. Okay, so that goes in here, let it be here. Okay, and I'm going to add some sodium or uh, potassium iodide to this. So I'm going to add some potassium iodide to this. Uh, I, no, I don't need gloves, but I need some water, distilled water. Mm -hmm. so the bottom oh, yes, yes, okay. Just a little bit more hydrogen peroxide. Okay, fine. And I will add, dissolve the sodium iodide or potassium iodide in water and add it. I would not, you know, nothing is happening. You know why nothing is happening? Can you guess? Normally, you know, by this time I won't be able to hold it. It will come out. I know what, why it's happening. Because I said sodium iodide, but I, I deliberately added sodium bicarbonate. Okay? Because just to show that it's not iod it's not sodium, but it's iodide which is the catalyst. Because if sodium iodide catalyzes the reaction, it can be either sodium or iodide. So by deliberately misleading you uh, by using sodium bicarbonate, I we have proved the point that it is not sodium that acts as the catalyst. Okay. So now we are going to add sodium or this is potassium iodide. It doesn't ma matter because we know that sodium doesn't do anything. So here I have potassium iodide and dissolve it in water. And now the fun starts, hopefully. No, we, we, cannot, we cannot hold it by hand because this will start coming out. Just leave it, leave it, leave it. That's the elephant toothpaste experiment. All right. So what you see is pure oxygen foam coming out. This is steam. So all we have produced and a little bit of, I get a little bit of smell from the perfume from, um, it says lemon fighters, okay? So some lemon is, lemon flavor is there. Some limonene perhaps. 
So we are getting H2O in the form of steam and oxygen bubbles. And how do you know these are oxygen? This is oxygen bubble and not carbon dioxide. Can we have the match state matchbox? Let, let's try with this. Because oxygen supports combustion. Ooh. You see it gets it's getting brighter. Okay? And um, if it were, huh? Yeah, if it were, if it were carbon dioxide, it would have extinguished. Okay? Uh, he will try once more. Okay, so this requires a bit of careful cleanup because there is some unreacted hydrogen peroxide. Watch out for your glove, though. Glove should not catch fire. Okay? All right, so, so this is an example of catalysis. We have not only shown that the catalysis improves the rate of decomposition of hydrogen peroxide, and also we have proved by using two different sodium salts that it is not sodium or bicarbonate, but it is iodide that causes the catalysis. Okay. Okay, so next three experiments are too dangerous to do here, so I'm going to show it only on video, okay, with, with audio. So the first is to talk about chemical bonding. You know, because periodic table is not only chemistry, because chemistry requires that these atoms either form bonds or if there's a bond present, the bond is broken. Because chemistry is all about making and breaking bonds. So you might have seen these sort of pictures, the orbitals. And if there is a small orbital, and a big orbital, the bond is a weak bond. It's like shaking hand with a baby, which may have a strong emotional component, but the physical bonding is weak. And this happens when you have a small atom such as nitrogen and a large atom such as chlorine or iodine. Okay, the bonds are weak. It's like 40 kilocalories per mole. And there is, a, there, is, there is no cue here, but I'm going to ask you a question. When I say 40 calories, how do I connect 40 calories with some real life calories? Well, um, this has no calories, right? But if you have a soft drink of the same size, it will have a lot of calories. Where are these calories come from? In Coke, for example. From sugar, right? And how many calories does a gram of sugar give? Seven, six, some other number? How many gram, how many calories does a gram of carbohydrate give? No, you have forgotten your, um, School science, four is the correct answer. Somebody said four. So protein and carbohydrate give one, four calories per gram. Oil or fat gives seven, uh, nine calories per gram, okay? So 40 calories is like two spoons of sugar, roughly. 10 grams of sugar. Okay, coming back to the orbitals, the bigger the orbitals are, are comparable sizes. The bond, the handshake is strong and the bond is strong. Okay, now here is an example of a molecule having three weak bonds. I said Ni is a weak bond. Now if I have Ni3, imagine a small nitrogen surrounded by three large iodine atoms. It has three weak Ni bonds, and that makes the molecule very unstable. Why do people make unstable molecules? Because they pack a lot of energy. And that energy can be, if it can be stored properly, it can be utilized later, for example, as an explosive, not for, um, not for creating disturbance, but for uh, developmental work. Okay, like how dynamite, dynamite is used for you know, exploding uh, rocks and other things, for, for making roads and things like that in hilly terrain. Um, so we would like to take some Ni3, and Ni3 has a very peculiar property. Uh, remember that during the Diwali time, 
uh, many of you have used crackers which you throw on the floor or on the ground and it explodes. And these are called shock sensitive materials, shock sensitive explosives. And Ni3 is a molecule which unfortunately cannot be put to good use because its shock sensitivity is very, very high. And we will understand why that is so from this video. When nitrogen triiodide, the dark colored solid, is dry, it is very sensitive to touch or any vibration. Simply touching it with a feather causes it to explode or detonate. One detonation causes another to occur. One product of the reaction is violet iodine vapor. So you notice that it is so shock sensitive that simply touching it with a feather can make it explode. And there's no cue here, but there will be a cue from me. And the question is, if it is so shock sensitive, how was it kept on the piece of filter paper to begin with? You are asking me. So who gets the chocolate? So, so you won't get the chocolate. No. Uh, yes, that, that's a very good, very good point. Uh, if it is so, so shock sensitive, how do you keep it on the filter paper? I'll come back to this later. Sorry? It, it cannot be made on the paper. But it's, you are getting close, but yeah? No, no oil. Uh, good question. I won't disclose that because uh, it is often made to trouble the teacher who comes through the door. And if you keep it on the floor, when the teacher walks in, it will make crackling sound. And these are things which many naughty students have done in the past to have a bit of chemistry knowledge. OK, let's move forward. One of the types of, I will come back to this. Uh, I think one of you can remind me, is about a weak bond. You know, hyd you know, some of you or most of you have heard about hydrogen bond. Hydrogen bond is very important not only in chemistry, but for life also. Because hydrogen bond is what makes H2O at room temperature, that is 25 degrees, li a liquid. And that sustains us, OK? And hydrogen bonding is also important for, what am I, sh what am I showing here? No. DNA will come to the right. No. That will not come today. This is a protein alpha helix structure, OK? And I, if I have time, I'll show you about the discovery of alpha helix. So alpha helix is a very important component in the structure of proteins. Proteins typically have, in a very simplified way, two types of building blocks. One is called alpha helix. One is called beta sheet. OK, of course, there are many variations in these. So hydrogen bonds keep the alpha helix intact. And of course, you have all heard about DNA double helix and the two arms or two uh, DNA strands are held together by hydrogen bond. And hydrogen bond is also what makes liquid water liquid, I mean H2O liquid. And the reason ice floats on water is because when liquid water forms ice, some of the hydrogen bonds are lost, OK? Because the water molecules move away from each other and forms a structure very similar to that of diamond. Okay, this is called a diamondoid structure. And I might, yeah, you, you are seeing an animation of liquid water becoming ice, and you will see that in the beginning, the molecules are, water molecules are very close to each other, but when ice forms, they open up, require a larger volume, and therefore the density decreases and it floats. Many of you have done this experiment. Take a bottle of water and keep it in the freezer, deep freezer. What happens? It will expand, and the bottle will get deformed. With a glass bottle, it will shatter. We will go to the other extreme. We'll take an iron container, fill water with it, and freeze it very quickly. OK? And let's see what happens. This is also too dangerous to do here. So I will take the easy way out and show you the video. 
The ice bomb illustrates the fact that the volume of ice is greater than the volume of an equal mass of liquid water. Some cold water is poured into a cast iron bomb and a threaded plug is screwed into the bomb so that the bomb is tightly sealed. The bomb is then placed into a dry ice acetone slush which is at negative 77 degrees Celsius and will cause the water inside the bomb to freeze. A wooden box is placed over the top of the bomb and slush bath. It takes a short time for the water to freeze. When it does, the bomb explodes. Some of the dry ice acetone slush is blown onto the explosion shield. Little bits of the cast iron bomb are left. When the water freezes, tremendous pressure is produced. The pressure is enough to cause this cast iron bomb with more than one eighth inch thick sides to burst. Okay, so you have simply lost hydrogen bonds in going from liquid water to ice. And this is the power of hydrogen bonds. So weak bonds are very, very useful but you have seen how you can make use of a collection of hydrogen bonds which simply disappear when you go from liquid water to solid ice. Okay, one more video on strong bonds. We have seen how weak bonds can be made to explode. We have seen how such as an I bond and hydrogen bond, but we will now try to make an attempt to break a strong bond. And the strong bond is that in carbon dioxide. You know, carbon dioxide is a very interesting molecule, now very important molecule rather, these days because we have four, more than 400 ppm of CO2 in the atmosphere, okay, now. And that is causing all kinds of problems. And this bond is very strong, 190 kilocalories per mole, but then it can be broken. It will be really nice if this, oxygen can be extracted out of carbon dioxide and converted back to carbon. But that's a process which can be called a reduction process. And that will require energy. Because you have liberated a lot of energy in burning a hydrocarbon with oxygen to produce CO2. So going back to the hydrocarbon or to carbon itself will therefore consume energy. But let's see one of the ways to do it. And this is again on a video, because this is a bit of a safe experiment, but it cannot be done. Magnesium is placed in a cavity in a block of dry ice. This is dry ice, solid CO2. The magnesium is ignited. You ignite the magnesium and cover it with another block of dry ice. And covered with another block of dry ice. So the burning magnesium has nothing, no air contact, no oxygen, but only dry ice around it. But see what happens. Despite the absence of air, the magnesium continues to glow due to its reaction with carbon dioxide. Because of this reaction, carbon dioxide cannot be used to extinguish magnesium fires. So if there is a metal fire, like lithium battery fire, or magnesium fire, I cannot use CO2 because it will continue to burn. Let's see what, what's inside. The reaction products are white magnesium oxide and black carbon. So, so, Magnesium has converted carbon dioxide, essentially extracted oxygen out and reduced it back to carbon, which is potentially a very useful reaction, but it is not practical. You know why? So you can say, okay, we will extract, we'll take all the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, burn it with magnesium, and then we get back carbon. Wonderful. Because magnesium does not occur free in nature. It always comes in the ores as carbonate and hydroxide. Dolomite and magnesite are the two ores which you might read about in class 11. 
and uh, it doesn't occur free in nature. So to get magnesium metal from the ores, you have to spend quite a lot of energy, and therefore this process is not sustainable. What about some other strong bonds, like breaking N N triple bonds? Do any of you know a way to make an N N triple bond? This will answer a question I asked right in the beginning. Okay, we'll come back to this. Yeah. Sorry? Lightning. Yeah, lightning does convert nitrogen in the atmosphere into NO and NO2. Yes, you are right. And that is one of the ways of making nitric acid. And this process is called Oswald process. Okay, but that's not what I had in mind. Nitric acid is a useful chemical. Yes, you have a question? Yeah? Yeah? When it is still? Yeah, yeah. So you get the chocolate. Let me see if I can target it. You know, when, when many explosives are damp, moist, they don't explode because water has a high heat capacity. They take away all the heat. That's why these patakas that you often buy during Diwali time, if it has been a rainy season before that, you keep it on the rooftop on a sunny day to drive the moisture out, OK? Because water, so, so you make it in water by a process that I will not tell you, but you can find out rather easily. And then put it on the filter paper when it is still dry and run away from it. OK, because I often say that even if you sneeze loudly, it might explode. I haven't done that experiment because uh, my cold and Ni3 preparations have always been, there has been a phase lag between the two. OK, um, Peter, I think I'll skip this. Till, uh, Ambika, till what time can we go? 3.30. 3.30, okay, then I will skip one experiment, this one. If time is possible, I will come back to this. Okay, this is an experiment I'm not going to do. But the next three experiments will be with colors. Okay, because chemistry is also about colors. So we'll do some fun color experiment. The first experiment is on solvatochromism. Does it ring a bell, some of you? It, you? You know about polarity, polar solvents, non-polar solvents? Some solvents are polar, like water. Some are non-polar, like kerosene, petrol, diesel, and so on. So solvents have different types. Uh, I think this is for the next experiment. Yeah, so leave it here, fine. So there is a dye, and, and you probably also know that uh, in many dry states, and not necessarily dry states, in, in, good, uh, in other states also, like uh, many people die because of eat, drinking methanol instead of ethanol. OK, both are poisonous, but methanol is much more than ethanol. And uh, it would be nice to have a simple way to distinguish between methyl and ethyl alcohol. And there's a dye called Rikard's dye, which is shown here, that shows very different colors in methyl alcohol, ethyl alcohol, isopropyl alcohol. I think many, some of you use it for, as a nail polish remover, right? Those who wear nail polish. So methyl, ethyl, isopropyl alcohol, all give different colors. So this is a very powerful, uh, molecule and it shows a very drastic change in color with the polarity of the solvent, even solvents which differ only by a simple CH2 group. Okay, and here's a more impressive collection in my from my lab. Um, this is in dioxane, chloroform, acetone, DMSO, and so on and so forth. Okay, all right. <clears throat> now I'm actually quite thirsty. I need some water to drink. Not cold enough. I need some ice. Can I get some ice?
sorry, sorry for the interruption. Something is happening, right? Actually, I'm not thirsty. I'll be thirsty for the next experiment. Um, something is not right. Either the water is bad or rice is bad or, you know what? And can I get a container to pour this out? Yeah, thank you. How do I know that whether it is the glass which has turned color or the water is, has turned color? By, by pouring it out. Right? So there is always an experiment to find out how, you know, find out answers to very simple questions. This, is, this sounds like a stupid question, but this is the stupid experiment I have done. Glass has turned no magic here. And let me hold it this way, and then you will figure out what's happening. OK? So the glass has some organic dye, which shows a change in color with temperature. So this is what is called thermochromism, change of color with temperature. And I will show you a couple of examples. Shabhi, oh. I will show a couple, of, couple more examples. Shamita, can you do this experiment? Or you can help one of the volunteers do this. So uh, let me go to the slide. First, explain to you. This particular silver salt, which has a yellow color, and we have painted a banana with this. This will turn from yellow to orange at about 51 degrees. So Shamita, you hold it and let her heat it up. Are you able to see it? Bring it, bring it, bring it a little closer. Lights on, please. Lights on, this side. Yeah, now you remove the, can you see it has turned orange? Is it clearly visible for you? That's right. But then it is reversible. You wave it in the air. Yeah, so your job is over. You send the hello. You send the other, other person, Aditya. OK. But you know what is interesting about chemistry is that, or periodic table, is that you change from silver to copper. And it goes from yellow to red. Not only that, oh, this is, this is apple. This apple, beautiful red apple, painted with Cu2HGI4. But now, when he heats it, you need to really heat it very close. See the color change. I'll, I'll hold it here. No, but it's not oh, okay. We have some limitations here. Yeah. Rotting. So the apple is getting rotten. Hmm? It's a little down. It's a little down. Ah. Yeah. Okay, that's enough. Yeah. Hold it. Hold it here. So now you see the apple is getting rotten appears to be rotten because uh, the red is becoming black. Yeah, turning back yeah, it, turned back. it turned back red because this happened at a much higher temperature of 67 degrees. And you know the room is ni nice and cool. So it, it becomes uh, fresh again. So this is a good way to convert a rotten apple into a fresh apple. <laughs> just, ki just kidding. Ah, this is actually pretty complicated. Because it is a crystal structure of uh, changes. And um, if you study crystal structure, there's a, there's a publication by one of the, uh, somebody named Kanishka Biswas from JNC ASR. He has a paper which describes it in great detail about what changes in the crystal structure and how it affects the band gap, which changes the color. Basically, the energy level between the highest occupied molecular orbital and the lowest energy level that changes, OK? But it's a little too complicated to discuss here, OK? But I can share with you, if you send me an email, the paper in which it is described. OK, last but one experiment, OK? Because time is ticking, and 
I have a small video to show you also. All right. <clears throat> what does this picture remind you? Hmm? Sunset, right? You see blue skies and you see orange or red sunset. And all of you have studied what causes the sky to appear blue and why the setting sun is red. Why is it that? It's because of scattering of light, right? Light gets scattered by dust particles in the, in the air. And there's a dependence of wavelength on the scattering, 1 by lambda to the power 4, to be precise. And blue light, having a shorter wavelength, gets scattered more. So the sky appears blue because we are seeing the scattered light in the sky. Whereas when the setting sun reaches us, setting sun rays reach us, the blue lights are scattered away by the dust in the lower uh, stratosphere. And what remains is the red end of the spectrum. All right. So when light passes through a medium, many things can happen. It can get reflected, refracted, scattered, absorbed. And when it gets absorbed, many things can happen. The absorbed light, light of course is a form of energy. The absorbed light can be released as heat. Okay? It can be released as light of a different frequency. And what is that phenomenon called? Absorb light of lambda 1, emit light of a different frequency, lower energy, higher lambda. Fluorescence, right? Luminescence in general. A third thing that can happen, which actually sustains us on Earth, is conversion of light energy into chemical bonds, photosynthesis. Okay? You probably never thought about that. Okay? So that happens because of sunlight, and the energy gets converted into glucose. So we are going to do some very simple experiments. The next set is here. <clears throat> I skip one experiment, you know, because A, time is a little short. That takes up at least about seven or eight minutes. And I need a couple of drops of milk. <clears throat> yeah, fine. Yeah. So there will be two sets of experiments. But can I also get the um, soda and the... Now I'm thirsty. Okay. Have you come across this can called tonic water? Did, did some? No, that's Coke. This is called Indian tonic water. Okay. This is a little history. This is different from soda. Both are carbonated, but I'll tell you. When the British came to India and the Southeast Asian countries, 300 plus years ago, they were not welcomed by people, except for a small group who benefited. They were also not welcomed by mosquitoes. And they all had malaria. Okay. And the only medicine known those days was quinine. And they thought that by taking a low dose of quinine every day, they might keep malaria at bay. So they added small amounts of quinine in water and called it tonic water. Of course, that was bitter. So to make it more easy to drink, they started adding other liquids into it. And since most of you are below the legal drinking age, I have masked the label, which was used to make this gin and tonic, but gin and tonic basically contains this tonic water. Okay. So what we are going to do is 
pour some soda here. Lights off, please. Pour some soda here. Pour some tonic water here. Okay. Huh? Yeah. Lights off, please. I'll switch up this one also. So one is tonic water, one is soda. And can you interchange these things so that I don't see it? I'm looking the other way. I don't know which one is which. Okay. Now, soda water has only water and CO2. Whereas tonic water has quinine and some sugar. And I have got this magic UV torch that will show fluorescence of quinine. One, two, three. This is tonic water. This is soda. Okay? Soda is showing only reflected light, but tonic water is showing the beautiful fluorescence from quinine. Okay, you can also see it this way. Okay, so this has this is a small UV torch, and you see this beautiful blue fluorescence from quinine. In fact, the study of fluorescence began with an accidental discovery of fluorescence from sunlight from a solution of quinine. Okay, all right, so that is all about this quinine or tonic water experiment. Second part of the experiment deals with light again, but it's a slightly different experiment. Let's have the lights on for a moment. And I'll pour some water into this one. This one. And this one, this is more of a physics experiment, but it's important, important in, chemi in chemistry also. So one is pure water, which I will use to show transmission of light. One is water with a couple of drops of milk to make the water a little turbid to show, to show what? Scattering, right. And what is this? See, when you are a scientist, or going to be a scientist, I will give you zero marks if you say it's a highlighter. It's a pink highlighter. <laughs> right? It's a pink highlighter, because the experiment I'm going to show you will not work with any highlighter. OK. This uses a dye called solvent dye 49. And I'm going to dump a little bit of the dye into this. Can you mix it? Oh, but then, you know, if I'm going to show you uh, fluorescence, I need some light source, monochromatic light source. Where do I find those? What is the cheap source of a monochromatic light? Not candle, not filter. No. I've been using this, you know, laser pointer, right? This is uh, 532 nanometers. Actually not. This is slightly longer. This is 515, slightly on the bluish side. And then I, I also have a red laser point. Now all lights off, please. <clears throat> so I have two light sources because it's always important to show it let me just be careful and make the right steps. OK. So pure water, red laser. Oh. OK, so this is not the red one. This is the red one. Yeah. I was pressing the wrong button. This is pure water, and you don't see the laser beam, right? Because light, water, of course, does not absorb the red light, which is 617 nanometer. 
and it falls on the floor, okay? It falls on the table. I think you are all able to see that. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. You, you, hold, you come here and hold it so that the transmitted light goes this way. This is a green laser. One second. Ah. Again, you don't see the green laser path, but the light beam, light beam reaches the surface, okay? I think this battery is weak, so I will use the other laser. That is a special battery which I don't have a spare, okay? You see the light getting transmitted, okay? So the second experiment is with the milk suspension, you hold it. And you see the light beam because it is getting scattered. That's that side, you turn around a little bit. So it is scattered red light. And, but red remains red and green remains green, right? So this is scattered light, what you see the light beam. That's not very exciting. We want more, okay, because transmission and scattering are only two things. At least we should see some more exciting stuff. That's why, that's why the pink highlighter, pink, I said, right? Pink highlighter is important. Red laser, red remains red. You see scattering because the dye, the highlighter has not only the dye, but also some other solid so that it spreads over the paper which you are highlighting. So that's what causes the scattering to occur. You bring it here. Ah, now the fun part. With milk, green remained green, but see what happens. Green becomes yellow, and this is because of fluorescence. Because the pink dye absorbs green light and causes a fluorescence in the green, in, in the yellow, but you see the transmitted light is actually green. Okay, transmitted light that you see on the table is green. Okay, so this is a nice example that you can actually do in at home, as long as you are careful with the laser, is uh, a simple experiment with, uh, we, can turn on the light. Uh, we can turn on the light now. And I will turn on the screen as well. So basically this is what we did. I'll skip this part. So we took this pink highlighter which absorbed green light and emitted in the orange red color, okay? So that's beautiful. Okay, last experiment. So far we are, you know, the previous experiment converted light of one wavelength into light of a longer wavelength. So that is fluorescence, conversion of one form of energy into light, light into light. Now, how is light generally produced? How do you create light? You can convert it from heat energy or from electrical energy. In the old, good old incandescent lamps, electrical energy will be converted to heat the tungsten filament and the tungsten filament will emit light. You can convert from chemical energy to heat to light. If you heat something like coal, okay, it becomes red hot and it emits light. In these LEDs, it is called electroluminescence. Electricity is used to create a whole electron pair and when they recombine, it emits light. How do fireflies emit light? They convert chemical energy directly into light by an enzymatic process. And since it happens in a biological system, it's called bioluminescence. Chemiluminescence is the standard term for it, a common term for it. Bioluminescence is a subclass of chemiluminescence. Now, this will be the last experiment for today, okay? <clears throat> 
We, are, we will use our good old friend hydrogen peroxide, which you know that has energy into it. It's a thermodynamically stable, kinetically unstable molecule. It's got more oxygen, more energy. So we will react it with oxalyl chloride, which is an acid chloride of oxalic acid, a diacid, simplest diacid you can have. And that will produce this strange creature, which is like, if you look at it closely, it's actually two carbon dioxide molecules stitched together. Okay, and it's very, very unstable because it has got a four-membered ring and a weak OO bond. So without any provocation, without any catalysis, it will break into two carbon dioxide molecules. And the reason I have colored it hot is because, colored it red is because it's hot. Okay, it's electronically excited. But that excess energy appears as heat, and that's rather uninteresting, right? You mix these two together, and the solution just warms up. It's no big deal. But if I use certain fluorescent molecules, they can trap this energy, and they themselves can get electronically excited. And if I now have molecules which are fluorescent, that is molecule A, when electronically excited A star comes back to its lower energy state, also called the ground state, it will emit a photon. And that's all about converting chemical energy directly into light without having to go through heat. And that will be the last experiment. So we will create firefly-like light and light of four different colors. Some of you might have seen experiments with these sticks or with luminol, but this will be, I hope, more interesting. We will use this molecule to generate yellow, uh, blue-violet light, orange-yellow light here with rubrine, cyan with perylene, and green with tetra tetracene, or it's like a two naphthalenes stitched together. Not only that, we will mix this and this to generate white light, okay, if it all works out. So this will take a few, couple of minutes to prepare. And I've got everything ready here. Thank you, Peer and others. And I need to get my things ready here. I would prefer to use these little droppers here. Yes. What is the turning? Why the that is because of the ferric chloride. Ferric chloride that I sprayed, that is iron chloride, and that is forming iron oxide. It's a rusting process. Thank you. That was a good question. Okay. Let me. Uh, and one of you can hold the torch here. Hmm? That's the purpose of the torch, because I need to see what I'm doing at some point. Oxalyl chloride, hydrogen peroxide, and what I will do, I will secure the hydrogen peroxide in some way so that I don't drop it on the, on the floor, on the table. I will secure it like this. OK, good. <clears throat> and I've got this fancy spatula. One of my favorites, thin one, that, that's what I'm going to use. So from the left to the right are the four dyes. These are the dyes that are supplied by Merck, and these are the expensive ones. OK, let me align them properly, because I've got some other stuff here also. Scene, diphenyl anthocene. All right. I will do these set a little bit later, maybe with a two-minute gap. OK, so in goes the diphenyl anthracene. I will not weigh these out. I'll use approximate quantities. These dyes are expensive. And this goes back into my small container. 
I won't call it by any other name, small box. And in goes Rub Green. This is also expensive, probably two or three hundred rupees worth. You know the D2O that I use, 3 ml, how much does it cost? No, that, not that high. Then it's about uh, 300 rupees. Each ml costs about 1,000 rupees, 100 rupees. And this is perylene. Um, perylene is cheap because perylene derivatives are used for making various kinds of car paints, particularly the bright red color, which I'm sure people at your age would like to have a car with a bright red color, right? <clears throat> so those are made with perylene. The rose uh, colors are made with perylene. And this is tetracine, like two naphthalene stitched together. This is the most expensive part. 100 milligrams is about 12,000 rupees. And here goes about 100 rupees worth of tetracine. But <clears throat> Mark has been very generous to send these things to me. I must acknowledge that during my talk. OK, done. Now I'm going to dissolve these in a little bit of dichloromethane, also known as methylene chloride, CH2Cl2. Again, a big thank you to Pierre for organizing this. One, two, three, and four, and I'm going to do a little bit of a control experiment. If I can get all the lights off, I'll, I'll first show the fluorescence from these dyes. You see the fluorescent color? This will should show orange color. But this is fluorescence because I'm using light to generate light. Okay, and now we are going to use chemical energy to generate the same light. Let's have the light on for a moment. Yeah, so that I position myself and I organize everything correctly. So when I ask you, you can focus on this one. So I need to keep these two away. So blue, violet, orange, and I'm going to mix, you know, these two turn out to be complementary colors, blue, violet, and orange. So when I mix them, it should produce white light. So what I'm going to do is to add the orange color into the gray, blue color. It will be orange, then white, then blue again, if all goes well. Let's try. So I first add oxalyl chloride and here and there, a little bit more perhaps. Now lights off, all lights off. Yeah, torchlight, I should see what I'm doing. So are we ready? Lights off. So as promised, I have on my on your left the red color from diphenylanthocene, and on your right the orange color from the, uh, from uh, perylene. Excuse me. This is rubrine. So I'm going to mix this orange with the blue and see what happens. This is orange for now. And if we keep swirling, it should become white for a short time, and then blue again. Time is running out, so we need to make sure that it, it finishes in four minutes. This might take a little longer, just based on what I see here. I added a little bit too much of this orange color, but then 
Just wait for another 10 seconds. It is turning white. White. And back to blue. As promised. Okay? All right. So this is also how you see that how mixing complementary colors can give you a different color. So now the last leg of the experiment before the bell rings. Cyan and green. There's some hydrogen peroxide here which we need to be careful about. Okay, so on your left, on my right hand, is the blue color coming from cyan coming from uh, perylene. And to your right, on my, on my left hand, is the tetracene color, which is green in color. Uh, the green color will not stay for too long. Some of the colors stay for a long time because the excited state or the molecule is stable under the conditions. But now you see all four of them. Be, be careful while wiping the hydrogen peroxide. So now you have a collection of all the four colors. The sky blue from diphenylanthracene, orange from rope green, uh, cyan from uh, perylene, and green from tetracene. Okay? So this is a sort of a complete spectrum going from you know, almost like the blue end all the way, if I keep it here, all the way towards a red-orange color. Okay? So violet blue in uh, violet indigo blue green and then orange and red okay so that's your spectrum on on the table okay so with this i will take yeah this is just an example when uh, during the pandemic i used to show these things on uh, on online so these are some of the experiment i'm i'm doing the titration experiment here for generating the white light and uh, finally lights on please all lights on Answer to this question. Yes. This is the reactor. This is a reactor, but what reactor? Ammonia synthesis. I said breaking nitrogen, nitrogen triple bond. This is a reactor built by Haber and Bosch. You have studied, some of you have studied Haber pro process for making ammonia. 2N, N2 plus 3H2 giving 2NH3. And ammonia gives us all the fertilizer, nitrogen fertilizers that we use. So this is an ammonia reactor. Uh, I just kept just outside the BASF factory in, in, in a place called Ludwig Schaffen near Frankfurt in, in Germany. And this produced uh, about 800 tons of ammonia over 55 years. So they have kept it outside their main office as a, as a uh, well, as a, you know, as a memory for, uh, for keeping it, uh, you know, keeping the, this concept alive. This is one of the first reactors built by Haber and Bosch. Okay, I don't have time to show you uh, the video on the life of Linus Pauling. The time is running out, uh, really, and then I see um, Kishore come in. Um, so one of the things that I should just quickly point out, another five minutes, 600 seconds, no, 300 seconds, excuse me. My math is bad. Okay, uh, so uh, one of the things that Pauling talks about here, you know, he was the only person who got two unshared Nobel Prizes. Two unshared Nobel Prizes, one in chemistry, one in, second one? In peace, okay, you should know that. So one of the things he says about the structure of alpha helix is that he discovered it just by accident. He was sick. He was in a hospital bed in Oxford and had nothing. And he started reading detective stories and he got bored. You know, all scientists get bored reading detective stories because there is no science in it. Okay, at least the way they're written, except, except Sherlock Holmes. That's my favorite. So what he did, he drew the structure of a peptide structure and started folding the paper to figure out how the hydrogen bonds can form from one turn of the helix to another turn of the helix. And by doing so a few times, he came up with the structure of alpha helix. And he said that I forgot all about it. And then he goes on to say that he started working on alpha helix 11 years ago, and he was not successful. Thank you. That's very timely, because I think I got some hydrogen peroxide on my fingertips. 
Okay. <clears throat> but he never gave up. So when you are after a good problem, never give up. Okay? Even if you are in a state of the frog. Okay? And one other thing that I would like to tell you is that always keep your eyes open, except while sleeping. Okay? And another way of saying it is what Louis Pasteur had said more than a century ago is chance favors the prepared mind. I don't know if you have heard this statement. Okay? Because many things nature presents to us. And unless your mind is prepared, many problems are presented by nature. Unless your mind is ready to explore and exploit, okay, you might miss a golden opportunity. So therefore, keep your eyes open. Okay. Back to elephant. Why do I have the elephant here? It's because of the periodic table. There's a mathematician named, I'll come back to the name a la little later, or maybe I should mention, Tom Leherer. Anybody heard of him? He composed a song called the periodic table song. I don't know if you have heard it, OK? It's called periodic table song. It was composed by him using the elements known in 1955 or so. Yeah. I think I got uh, hydrogen peroxide on, on, on this one. I think I've got some Dettol uh, thing in my cloth bag. Yeah, so this one, got it. I got it here. I think it's okay. No, no, not hand wash, I think. Some uh, wet wipes. So one has to be a bit um, careful. I should have worn gloves, but it doesn't matter. There's always some backup. OK, sorry about the interruption. But um, yeah, but I need this one. Thank you. So Tom Leherer came up with this song called Periodic Table Song. There's one with some animation, but I'm going to play the song. And you, you, you want to hear it from the horse's mouth, so to speak, right? So here is a song from Tom Leherer from a live program from Copenhagen in 1967. OK, and I'll stop with this. Now, here's a song I always get requests for, but I can't understand for the life of me why. Can we dim um, the front light? It's uh, simply the names of the chemical elements set to a Gilbert and Sullivan tune. I think the only reason I do it is to see if I still can. We'll try. There's antimony, arsenic, aluminum, selenium, and hydrogen, and oxygen, and nitrogen, and rhenium, and nickel, neodymium, neptunium, germanium, and iron, americium, ruthenium, uranium, europium, zirconium, lutetium, vanadium, and lanthanum, and osmium, and acetine, and radium, and gold, protoactinium, and indium, and gallium, and iodine, and thorium, and thulium, and thallium. There's yttrium, ytterbium, actinium, rubidium, and boron, gadolinium, niobium, iridium, and strontium, and silicon, and silver, and samarium, and business, bromine, lithium, beryllium, and barium. I left out one, actually. A new one was discovered since the song was written. It's called Laurentium. So uh, those of you who are taking notes can write it down in your programs. There's holmium and helium and hafnium and erbium and phosphorus and francium, fluorine and cherbium and manganese and reconine and lignin and magnesium and discosium and scandium and cerium and cesium and lead, praseodymium and platinum, plutonium, palladium, promethium, potassium, polonium, and tantalum, technetium, titanium, tellurium, and cadmium and calcium and chromium and curium. There's gold and californium and fermium and berkelium and also mendelevium, einsteinium, nobelium and argon, kryptonium, radon, zinc, nonsense, and rhodium and chlorine, copper, cobalt, copper, tungsten, tin, and sodium. These are the only ones of which the news has come to Harvard. And there may be many others, but they haven't been discovered. I shouldn't get any credit for this because, you know, uh, it's all available on the web. Uh, with this, I would like to conclude, but just 30 seconds. 
because you know what is the last element that has been named by IU, IUPAC? Element 118. And you know IUPAC is involved in this. So speaking of IUPAC, I would li just like to show you a picture with IUPAC's current president. And here's a picture uh, for a similar show that we did in uh, Cape Town last year. That's where the picture of the Table Mountain came from. And this is the current IUPAC president, Professor Javier Martinez from France. And this was my volunteers at that time. And this was my team. And here are some examples from other places, uh, and including one from a school in Suttur, uh, which you see here in the uh, southern part of Mysore. And here is one for public. Uh, this is for general public earlier this year in, in Bangalore. And here is one that we are doing today. I think uh, one of you is missing here. You are missing because you took the picture. So once again, I would like to take this opportunity to thank my entire team here for helping us do this. And thank you all for being patient throughout the, throughout the show. And thank you, Ambika. Thank you, Kishore, for making this possible. And thank you for giving me a few minutes of extra time. Thank you very much.